Thanks. Yes, you, you'll understand if I nod off during this talk. <laughs> I've been at Purdue several hours now, and so uh, uh, we'll see how that works out. Yeah, uh, when Spaff told me about it would be great if you come by, uh, it was, uh, I tried to work it into an ACM meeting, so I would miss a class less. And I just didn't realize I was going to arrive in the middle of the night to do this. But this is, uh, this, you're going to hear some slides that I've used before, but there's a bunch of slides that are brand new for this audience, so I'll try them out on you guys. Uh, you know, I, I'll probably try and keep the questions towards the end so I can get through uh, the bulk of the material, but I'll make sure that I'll stop at least 10 minutes before the end and maybe longer so there's questions but because there's a lot of provocative stuff in here. So how, how did I come up with this title, How to Hurt Scientific Productivity, is friends and I talked about, since we saw a, bad, a lot of bad talks early in my career, it'd be fun to give a talk on how to give a bad talk and uh, that was, uh, that was an effective way to make the point. And so then uh, later did a thing on how to have a bad career, and that was a fun thing to do, and I still give that talk. So it's out of that out of thrust, it's how to hurt scientific productivity. It's talking about kind of the legacy that computer architects in particular, but computer science in general, has done to affect the rest of the sciences here. So that'll be uh, the first part of the talk. So architecture, Bad thing number one, aim high and ignore Amdahl's law. Um, and basically, peak performance is what sells. You know? And plus, more jobs for us to try and get that performance out of those, out of, out of, get a fraction of that peak performance. And what are examples of that? Very deep pipelines, very high clock rates, uh, relaxed write consistency, that's something that computer scientists invented that have made the world more difficult for everybody else. Out of order message delivery is another one of those things that makes programming even more challenging to try and achieve that peak. Second one, promote, promote history, hide thy real performance. Uh, you know, if it's predictable how sophisticated it can be, and if it's unsophisticated, how it can it be expensive? That's kind of our, our <laughs> approach. What's examples of that? Out of order of execution processors. Who knows how long to code takes? Nobody has it. The, the inventors don't know how long things take on an out of order processor. There's memory controllers with secret prefetch algorithms. You, they won't tell you what the prefetch algorithm is. Try and figure it out yourself. And uh, amazingly, in my field, as far as I can tell, that formula is correct. That every <laughs> <laughs> every every decade we get another level of caches. So okay, there were, I remember when microprocessors had no caches. You know, and for pipelining, a separate instruction data cache. Okay, I understood that one. Second level cache, kind of understood second level cache. So, you know, it could be bigger, different organization. Third level cache, I don't understand that one. How can there be, there's a second level cache, there's a third level of cache that's made from the same, what the hell's going on there? So, uh, be interesting and have a quirky personality. It sounds like a dating advice here, but <laughs> that's what we do in computer architecture. And programmers enjoy a challenge. And plus job security if you get to rewrite your application every time. So examples of that. Amazingly enough, our translation look-aside buffer implements a virtual memory. If you try to touch all the memory in this third level cache that's on a chip, you'll get translation buffer errors. So you're just trying to, you know, right there in the same chip, a little bit further away, you try, and you get a TLB exception because the TLB page sizes and stuff haven't kept up with the sizes of the memories on chip. Uh, though our friends who have tried to program message passing clusters composed of shared address machines have just found how difficult it is to have those conflicting views. Interconnection networks that are pattern sensitive. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. And then tr this, here's a great idea. Graphical processors weren't designed to compute on. Let's try and do scientific processing on graphical processor units, which are bad to program. Uh, another another, uh, another uh, thing that we do is we really don't give a damn about whether it works or is reliable. We just want it to be fast. <laughs> it sounds like we're building, uh, you know, Indianapolis race cars here, right? Uh, so don't waste. Uh, Resource and accuracy and reliability, they'll just blame Microsoft anyway, so <laughs> you won't be blamed, right? So what have we done? Well, Cray and others built an IEEE 754 floating point format, but it, it was the format, you know, not compliant, so you don't get the same results on your workstation as you get on a supercomputer. Sun suffered mightily when they didn't put ECC on their second level cache in, in uh, the UltraSpark several years ago. That's not a mistake Sun will ever make again. Uh, amazingly enough, you know, people at Virginia Tech made a supercomputer cluster out of Macs 
but they got them without ECC on memory. He couldn't buy it without, that was the only way he could buy it. They didn't have ECC for memory, so guess what? It took them a long time to get a LINPAC result that actually got the right answer. So in fact, what they did is they had to ship them all back and get the ones with ECC. And then these companies that declare they're going to have air-free communication work so you don't have to do uh, air checking in the messages. You don't need that field. Well, you, know, that's, you find that the hard way you do. Okay. So that's kind of our legacy of building these machines that have interesting high performance and don't work very well. And then we leave it up to programmers to try and figure that out. Well, if we don't want to hurt scientific productivity, what should we do? Aim high. Now, let's worry about delivered productivity rather than peak performance. Productivity. So time for a programmer to solve a problem. Promote mystery. Now, how about a simple, understandable model of execution performance? In computer architecture, uh, there's fads in computer architecture. So vector was this very effective idea that PhDs in physics could understand. It was considered old-fashioned, and we replaced it with this newfangled VLIW and second generation a double epic. The problem with these, and superscalar and out of order, these were much more modern because they're more general, but they're also almost impossible for a person with a PhD in physics to understand how to program. So think about that. Somebody who can get a PhD in physics can't figure out how to use the computers we're making. Right? How about be interesting? How about making it uh, no programming surprises? And what about reliability? Well, you know, it, you're not going fast if you're headed in the wrong direction, right? So we should work on that. So, I, you know, the challenge for computer designers and computer systems is take productivity seriously. And they really don't have any excuses. You know, things were slow when back in the day when, when uh, you know, in the 80s, you know, when you tried and compile a little coffee cup would come up on your screen. So that was like time to go get a cup of coffee, right? So performance was the main problem then. Maybe, maybe it was the main problem then. But you know, things are 1,000 or 10,000 times faster. Performance is not the main problem. These other things are important today. And making things untrustworthy, I.O. starve and stuff, we don't have excuses for that anymore. OK, so this is, that was the first opening salvo from my talk. And so I've got two new parts. Uh, part two is nobody's ever seen this before, so we'll see what the reaction is here. Let's think about new ways of doing new computer architectures in the 21st century. I'm going to start this out by talking about what's changed over the years. Old conventional wisdom and new conventional wisdom, uh, using, following the Newsweek approach to that. And then I'm going to talk about a new way of doing uh, computer architecture, about looking toward the future than the past. And then the part three, we'll talk about new ways of building computers uh, compared to the past. So conventional wisdom and computer architecture. It used to be that chips are the things that are reliable if, it's, if it works. If it boots, it'll last more or less forever, but the pins are a little bit unreliable. What's happened is things get smaller and smaller as we head towards 65 nanometer, which designs are underway today. There's going to be much higher soft and hard air rates. Soft air rates, not surprisingly, because things are small, but even things wearing out, which is kind of new to us. So that's new. In the past, lots of us, uh, including people here <laughs> in the past, have tried to demonstrate new ideas by building chips. Here's a radical idea will show it's valuable by building a chip to make it to demonstrate the value of these ideas. Today, the, the cost of the, just the mass themselves are millions of dollars. The cost of the ECAD software is millions of dollars. And it's really hard to design a gigahertz clock rate chip. So basically, researchers can't do that anymore. We can't build chip, chips that are believable to, to convincing ideas. It's too expensive, and they probably aren't going to be as fast. The other things that we did, especially in the RIST days, was what innovation in architecture was a combination of compiler optimizations and architecture. There was this hardware-software barrier. You did some things in the compiler, some things in the architecture, and crossing that threshold allowed innovation. What's happened, over, and I don't know why, maybe somebody can explain this, but what's happened is now time idea in the main language compiler conference to it shows up in a compiler is now more than a decade. So this is kind of a problem for innovation. If here's great idea and start your watch. OK, <laughs> let me know when a decade goes by, and then we'll see if the compilers use it yet. So th that's, that's a challenge for us today. When I started this field, I'd say I used to do lectures. We call it hardware because it's hardware change, software because it's flexible. That's what I used to say. Now hardware is flexible. Software is the hard thing to change. <laughs> I, you know, this is true. It's, if, if you're going to start a company, the ma you'll do anything in hardware, just as long as you don't have to touch the software. 
So we're in this weird parallel universe where software is brittle and hardware is flexible. And other universes are more sensible. Hardware, that's the hard stuff. Software, we can change. But that's not where we live today. OK, striking a little closer to home, it used to be that power is free and transistors are expensive. But it always surprised me that we, you know, if I increase the power of my design, nobody said anything. So guess what? People have been doing that. They keep increasing the power to go faster. What's today, we're at a power wall. Power is expensive, transistors are free. We can put more in a chip than we can afford to turn on. So this is, this is, <laughs> this is a big deal. This is a big deal. If you talk to Intel designers, power is the challenge. Power is the challenge, okay? That's the first wall. Second wall, I, when I was in school, what was it? Multiplies were slow, if, and if multiplies were slow. Floating point multiplies were ridiculously slow. But loads and stores were fast. That's, that's the way it was. So what's the world today? A memory wall. Memory is slow, multiplies are fast. So in a modern microprocessor, it could take easily 200 clock cycles to go to DRAM. Floating point multiply, that's just a couple of clock cycles. Okay? That's, that's where we are today. So I don't know how you're teaching your courses here. <laughs> which, but you know, if you can actually do, oh, thank God, I can get rid of that load. It's only 10 floating point multiplies. That might be a good trade-off. But it's hard to wrap your mind around that. So how, for 15 years, we doubled the performance 18 months. How did we do that? Well, it wasn't just the guys at Intel and the people in electrical engineering figuring out how to build transistor transistors. Moore's law gave us more transistors, and we came up with a lot of innovations to take advantage of that to keep that law going. And that's called taking advantage of instruction level parallelism. Well, we're at an ILP wall. We've pretty much run out of ideas. More or less, we've run out of ideas. Anything else that's even more exotic than it's been done, we get very little uh, return on that investment. So what does memory wall plus power wall plus ILP mean? It means brick wall. <laughs> brick wall. So f as you'll see, we, for a long time we were able to double performance every 18 months. Now, who knows? So here's, here's a slide from a, a very popular textbook. <laughs> <laughs> And the good thing about being a popular textbook over time is we can get old editions to stick the data in. So back in the day when some of us were brand new professors, the VAX came along and it was just this greatest thing ever invented. And amazingly enough, the VAX 1170 came out and we had to wait six years to get a processor that was 50% faster. And nobody complained. Everybody thought it was great. It was six years. And after some number of years, they finally got one that was five times faster. This is about when the risk stuff took off. And for the next 15 years, it was doubling every 18 months, 52% per year. But guess what? That ended in 2002. So this is using the spec int programs translating between different generations. But 2002 was the last year with the 50%. And since then, it's, a, it's been about 20% a year. But I don't want to quote that, because I don't know what it's going to be. But if, if in 2006 this continues, which I expect it to, we're going to be off a factor of three. So, if you th still thought things were doubling every 18 months, the, the, micro pro the desktop computer you're going to buy today is just three times slower than you should have thought. So this is a big change, right? And so what's been happening for my software colleagues, I think of them as sitting on the easy chair, right? They just sit there. The code gets faster and faster and faster. They're just, we're working like hell. They're just taking it easy. And their program's in faster. Why work hard, right? And that's, <laughs> that, that worked. That was a good strategy up to 2002, right? But since then, it's not, your program's code's not getting faster. And if you need to, the code needs to get faster to put new features in, and you're waiting for computers to get faster to do that, you're going to have to wait a long time. So this is this big deal. This is one of the reasons I'm giving the talk, is the sea change in chip design, that the future is multiple, what's called cores, but they're multiple processors per chip. So uh, in putting this historically, you know, 30-some years ago, Intel 35, Years ago, Intel announced that the world had changed. They had invented a microprocessor. And that first one had 2,312 transistors. Well, this is one of my favorite microprocessors, RIS-2. We have enough resources today to put 2,312 RIS processors, including floating point and caches, on, on a modern chip in a modern technology. So we could have the same number of microprocessors as we had transistors in the first microprocessor. So, here, part of that C chance. The processor is the new transistor. The processor is the building block from which we build something uh, phenomenal. That's the low, lower bound, not the transistor. So this may sound familiar for those who've been in the field for a while. There's a, 
Today's processes are nearing impasse. Technology is approaching the speed of light. Who said that and when? Well, that was a guy who worked for Transputer in 1989. So today's microprocessors are nearing an impasse, 1989. Let's, let's put that on the chart. He said that right here, right? <laughs> microprocessors aren't going to get any faster. Well, he was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. So, all right. Uh, so that was bad timing and procrastination is rewarded. Why do parallelism? So we are de dedicating all of our future products to the development of multi-core designs. This is a sea change in computing. Who said that? The president of Intel said that. <laughs> and he said that in 2002, going back to our slide. He said that, he said that in 2004. He said that two years into the flattening, right? He said, okay, we're, and basically Intel that same year canceled a bunch of uniprocessor projects and had an emergency processor effort in a way that they're still trying to catch up today. And so that's the big change if you've been in the field for a while, is that the differences from, you know, the claims in the past, they always use speed of light, which wasn't true, uh, is no one's building faster uni processors. All the company, you know, Intel was the last one to the game, and here's the processors per chip. Some, most microprocessor companies are, have hardware support to support more than one thread per processor. So there's Intel will have four threads or two processors. IBM already a couple years ago had two processors and four threads. And Sun has this radical design announced last year with eight processors, four threads each, so 32 threads. So from a programmer perspective, there's a 32-way parallel here. So the difference why, why, this sounds like, you know, I've already heard this before and it was wrong. The difference is the product plans are made for the next five years. They're going to keep building multiprocessors in this field of dreams model where if they build it, they're sure the software will come. This is going to happen. It's not, maybe it's going to happen, maybe it won't. They're going to build it. Can we take advantage of it? What do we have to do to take advantage of it? Okay, so that's, so I will pause right there. Let me, <laughs> if the nothing else is de declare that at Purdue, February 9th, 2006, we won't have any more arguments about whether the future is parallel. So does anybody want to take me on in this one right now? <laughs> Go ahead, <laughs> give me your best shot. Anybody? Okay, so if nobody says anything, then that's speak now, forever hold your peace. Okay, see, it's over. <laughs> All right. So uh, given that background, uh, what have computer architects always done in the past? And basically said, who knows what the programs are going to be important in the future? You can't know that. So what we're going to do is to try and to figure out these new designs is take a, a set, a reasonable set of old programs and evaluate them for the future. So spec is an example of that. But that's, a, that's you know, so if we could know the future, we'd use that. Okay, well that kind of, that's fine if we're still doing uniprocessors. What are we going to do? Where are we going to get the parallel codes to design the computers of the future since the codes aren't parallel? What are we going to, we're stuck. So what we're talking about, the, the new slide radical thing to do here that we've been talking about, a group of us at Berkeley, is let's design the computers of the future using numerical methods that are going to be important in the future. So we're going to claim we're going to know what's important in the future. So one of the key claims is one of my colleagues at Berkeley, uh, Phil Colella, who's uh, I think in the mechanical engineering department, has said in the next decade there are seven dwarfs, as he calls them, that are going to be important in the future. So maybe the codes will vary, but these dwarfs are going to be important for at least the next decade. So focus on them. And what we're going to do is take his claim and add some to that to get a more rounded set. And that's what you're going to hear about in the next slides. And you're the first people to hear this. Okay. And what's the big deal? Well, what the big deal is, what computer architects do is saying, since, we, since people say we don't know what the applications are going to be, what they do is make the most general, that is, can capture all types of parallelism, computer architectures, languages, and compilers, and so on. If we really could know what the dwarfs were, we could focus on the important ones rather than build the most general system we could think of. So that's what the big deal if this bet is true. So what did Colella mean by the seven dwarfs? He was talking about these seven numerical methods, structured grids, particularly if you know what AMR is, adaptive mesh refinement, that's a version of it. Unstructured, fast Fourier transform, dense and sparse linear algebra, particles methods, and Monte Carlo. He said this is it. This is the list, speaking as a scientific uh, uh, speaking as a numerical scientist, these, this is the ones that are important in the future. Uh, so what we did is take that list and go kind of to the opposite end of the spectrum 
And there are a set of programs called the Embassy Benchmarks. This is for embedded design. And said, well, how well would those seven methods do against the 41 Embassy Benchmarks, which are also kernels? And what we found was those, they were used quite a bit. Some of them were used quite a bit. But we had to expand that set to cover the benchmarks. We added searching and sorting, filter like DSP filters, combinational logic. Those are kind of you know, straightforward things. We have this other category, kind of a grab bag called finite state machine, which, you know, this is one that we, that I'm not going to tell you what that means because we're just, we're still working on figuring out what that means. But if we added that four to those seven, that covered the other end of the spectrum, right? So that was pretty interesting. And recently we've been looking at the spec, so that's the, you know, embedded, the, what Colella claims is the future for supercomputer type things. We looked at the spec programs, which are divided into integer and floating point, and look, well, this finite state machine category, we've got a study that covered some of them, but sorting and searching and dense linear algebra, that covered the integer ones. For GCC, the compiler one, we didn't include that because basically GCC is this big program that we have to look more, but maybe it's got a lot of kernels in it. So a lot of these methods are inside of GCC, but that's, that's hand wavy. We look at the floating point ones, structured grid is eight of those benchmarks, and AMR, if you know what that is, is almost half of those. Sparse linear algebra, uh, particle methods. Uh, a bunch of these other ones are big codes that we have to look in more detail that hasn't been done. Maybe ray tracer would be another, is pretty different from what's going on, and maybe it's a new dwarf there. So, but, you know, embassy suites, the spec programs, uh, and the dwarfs, it looks like this might be a small set. So this is, you know, an intermediate result, but you know, the claim is maybe a dozen or so of these numerical methods well-defined would be the things we should be spending our attention on in both architecture and languages and so on. Okay. So that's, you know, a, a radical perspective, looking forward rather than looking backwards. Okay, another radical perspective is some work that's been going on at Berkeley and elsewhere. Remember the thing about the compilers taking a decade? That's pretty bad for innovation. So another approach, and I'm using the word auto-tuner, and we'll see if that fix, sticks. But there's been some things that have, programs have been created that say rather than compile to an instruction set architecture, let's have a program that tries to e evaluate that particular computer that you're going to run on. So it's going to look, it's going to try some codes out. And based on the results of while it's running, it's going to figure out what are the best optimizations for that particular computer, such as blocking size, I'll give you an example of that, or padding of things. And even potentially algorithms, like on these sparse matrix ones, there's actually a lot of different ways you might do it. Let's take a look at the data set and stuff, and we'll use different algorithms. So what are we going to do with that information? Then what we're going to do is produce C code, and then you'll just use the C compiler for that computer to turn the C code, and you get the code and the registry allocation, all that. But kind of compilers in this kind of radical perspective, auto tuners are doing the important stuff. The C compiler is just doing the, you know, the code generation and register allocation, the easy stuff, right? This is, this is a different split that's going on, in part because it takes a, a whole decade before you get those ideas in. Let's not do that. And here, here are a bunch of examples of ones that have been done kind of in, in, I think, chronological order. And the blast ones are using Atlas, which is done this way. And so what tying in the dwarfs that maybe it's hard to know what a, what a dwarf quite is, it's a little vague but maybe we'd be thinking about having one of these so-called auto-tuners per dwarf. If we have a dozen of these things, maybe there should be an auto-tuner for that. Okay, so what do I mean specifically about that? Let's use sparse matrix for, for the finite element problem. So for, you think sparse matrices might just be these scattered non-zeros and some, you know, w throughout the code, but at least for finite elements, they tend to be blocked together. And people, you know, one kind of thing you do is use eight by eight blocks. So you have these dense ones where the ones are and there's in zeros everyone else. Okay, so eight by eight blocks might be the thing you use. But you could use, if that's logically eight by eight, you could use a lot of different sizes. You know, you could build them out of, uh, what I say here, four four by four blocks, four two by eight blocks, eight two by four blocks, like that. You could take the eight and put them in these little pieces. Now, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just use eight by eight? It's because the way we build computers today, all kinds of things come into effect in deciding which is best. The registers, the cache size, the block size, whether there's prefetching, how well does the compiler work? All those things interact in some complex way, so who knows what the right answer is. And like I said, what the idea is, the auto-tuner 
what we'll do it, at install time, it investigates the computer, and then at runtime, it investigates the data and try and pick the right thing to do. And so here's an example of this. So the Itanium, which is Intel's attempt to build a, a, a VLIW that particularly is aimed at um, uh, it, what it does best is floating point. So here's the different blocking sizes in the column and the row. And this is color quartered, the so-called temperature. And one by one is the reference in terms of megaflops per second. And you see what happens there is the very best combination is four by two. Okay? And that's a factor of four better than, than one by one. And if you use the eight by eight, I think it's factor two and a half better. So how in the world would you figure that out you know, without an auto-tuner? And what I did is I looked at uh, Kathy Yellick and Jim Demmel have done this research as part of the BBOC group. And they looked at eight different computers and looked at what was the best row and column size, what was, got the best blocking. And what you see across these eight computers is every single column size was the right answer for a different computer. And it's actually uh, five different ones that were picked. And you see things like, as we go from the power three from IBM to the power four from IBM, it shifted the quadrant, right? It went from a four, four to a four, one. And the titanium from generations went from a four, one to a four, two. So how in the world can the compiler figure that out? Even if you got the opposition, I don't know how it could do that. But w if you just put a little dynamic phase in it where it did some investigation before, and then it's actually, it's, you can write the code and uh, you, you can ship it, and Berkeley does do that. Okay, so dwarfs, auto tuners. The other thing we've been thinking about in this phase is about how are we going to classify parallelism. And old conventional wisdom was the good old SISD, SIMD, MIMD model from, uh, go back to Flynn's days, which is very, a really old paper that was, gave insights into how to classify things. Shared memory processors versus message passing is another one, and weak versus strong scaling in terms of how you add data to it. So what we've been thinking about is these, I don't know if they're new measures, but this is the measures we've been thinking about. How about something simple like just the size of operands, the style of parallelism, and then the amount of parallelism, which is a pretty standard thing to do. So, so as we looked, particularly as we looked at embassy supercomputing and desktop, is what we saw that there were a bunch of data sizes that would make sense to the algorithm that weren't necessarily supported in modern computers or even programming languages. So sure, 8 to 64 bits is pretty well supported. But Boolean often isn't well supported in programming languages or architectures. And there's other sizes. You know, quad precision floating point is, you know, there's already a need for quad precision floating point, even though there's no computers that support it and no languages support it. And what about, you know, crypto sizes? So kind of one of the things you'd think would be pretty easy to change an algorithm in a programming language, just let's just say change the type and size of data, let's just do that declaration. The algorithm could change the same. The compiler ought to do for that for us. You don't support that yet. So that seems like a, something ought to get fixed. OK, now, and this is another you know, attitude slide that is surely controversial here. But let's talk about ex for explicit parallelism, not this instruction level parallelism stuff. Let's try and rank this from uh, you know, kind of easiest to build and easiest to understand to the hardest to understand and build. And if you buy that, what the, classification we came up with data level parallelism where you do the same operations on lots of data, data level parallelism. And vector is one version, but there's other data level parallelism. Then a bunch of different versions of threaded level parallelism, and then data flow is the most radical at the bottom. So it's th threaded level parallelism where you're doing independent tasks, there's no coupling, so-called stream coupled, maybe you have a functional pipelining, you've got the stream of data blasting through. Barrier coupled, where you, you compute, there's a, you wait everybody to barrier synchronization. More tightly coupled, where you, the <coughs> synchronization is spread throughout, and then data flow at the bottom. So, so this, is, this, could, this data flow can run, anything that can run in data parallelism could run on all of these data flow. Maybe a, a tightly coupled probably can't go the other way. So this is this ranking that we put here. And so the thing that we kind of recognize, if I just change that axis the other way, what was kind of interesting is besides being easy to program, you can kind of argue that the programmer wants to go way to the left to run on as many different computers as possible, as well as being easy to program. And what the architect, if you don't know what's going on, he wants to go, he or she wants to go way to the right because you want to run as many different types of programs as you can. So 
A lot of architects are working for tightly coupled thread-level pairs and data level flow because they want to run as many programs as possible. They're more general than the ones on the left. On the hand, programmers kind of have the opposite thing. Clusters are over there towards the left. There's more clusters than there are these other things. So I'm going to run programs over there. Okay. All right. So given that background, we decided to try and, and do this axis. And what the question is, how would the dwarfs match on it? So one is a log scale of parallelism. How much parallelism is available? It depends in part on how big the operands are. And then in this model is this ranking of a lot of parallelism, of data parallelism towards the front of the graph and data flow to the back, with data flow the most general data level parallelism the easiest to program. OK, if you with me so far. So this framework would allow us to evaluate some existing computers. So these are good examples of each of these. So a vector processor, it tends to have 32 to 64 bit data. It's data parallel. Clusters are thread level with no coupling. Again, 3264. There's this thing that was done at Stanford, a stream processor called Imagine, the same data size. And maybe it goes up to 100 processors. Clusters tend to go to 1,000. Vector tends to be under 100. The CM5, which was, a, which was a, from Thinking Machines, which is a barrier cell synchronization. Tightly coupled, there's this transactional memory from Stanford tends to be not so many processors, uh, 3264. And then the data flow monsoon was uh, not there. So that was a way. So here's a framework we could think about architectures. And I said, I think these days, there's a lot of attention at this end of the architecture spectrum. And even people looking at data flow again, not so much at this end. OK, what happens with the dwarfs? Well, what we think is the original seven dwarfs, surprisingly, are all down at this data flow edge. You could write them other ways. Uh, and I think the Monte Carlo is thought of as no coupling thread level, but six of the seven ones are data parallel across those sizes. Um, the extra dwarfs that we added seem to also still be towards this end of the spectrum, either data parallel or thread level parallel here. When we did this same kind of analysis, uh, there's a lot of embassy benchmarks. So we kind of put down the parallelism the style and the amount of data, the data varied between 8 and 32 bits for the embassy ones. But all, all the data parallel ones, the highly parallel ones are data parallel, and there are a couple of others there. So, uh, so this kind of like just for Purdue results. Uh, kind of interestingly, it looks like if we're right about these are the important programs of the future, and we design languages, things about it, they're a lot simpler. They're over at, at this end of the spectrum with data level parallel and thread level parallel. by far most of them, despite the architects working over here. And I don't know what's happening in languages. OK. So that's, that's part two. I could pause and drink some water and see if anybody wants to. I can handle a couple of questions on that one. Clarifying. Yeah. So if you look at the total workload on non idle Yeah, so what our claim is, looking forward, these are the ones. So I remember, I remember when I went to graduate school, it was like, you hear these statements, like 40% of all the computers in the world are doing sorting. Well, that's, an interesting, that's a hell of a statement. You know? <laughs> but the claim would be like Google, if you look in there, you will, it's not like they're running particle methods. But you know, if you look at what they're doing, you can break them down on these big ones. This is our provocative statement. This is just a claim right now. We're basing this on Phil Kahlo's claim, and that's inspiring this. We're going to try and follow this up to see if with some factual evidence in case, just to prove we know we're right, but we might want to check, just see if we're right. <laughs> might want to check. But that's, that's the claim. Or that even if it's not true of software today, in the next five to 10 years, this is going to be true. And that from my perspective as a computer architect, even if it's not quite true, that these are the important new directions of new programs. And if you can run these codes well, you will be able to run the programs of the future better than if you focus backwards on the old spec programs. That, that, that's that's the, the argument. Here. That's a really related question. You're essentially telling us the numerical programs are becoming more important. Just recently, I heard a keynote talk of a famous architect telling us the numerical uh, world is a zero billion dollar market. We should forget about it. Uh, the, the, so yeah. So the, the question is about the size of the supercomputer market versus the algorithms, right? So what, what we yeah well, what we talked about uh, I gave you three examples. One of them was uh, so you said this is a numerical thing, supercomputing 
uh, as opposed, and that's not a very big market. So what I'm talking about is the al or the numerical methods themselves, not whether they're floating point necessarily. So when we looked at the spec programs, some of which are integer and some of which are floating point, they were using some of the same numerical methods, even though they weren't floating point. In the embassy, zero percent. There was zero percent floating point, but yet they were still using some of the same dwarf. So that's that. That's that slide about the the data size, right? The data size and, and the data type. So we believe the claim is there are you know 16-bit integer uh, data types that are doing sparse matrix and uh, dense matrix, and that's important in the embedded space. It's the, and I believe as a computer architect, today it's not that big a deal whether it's floating point or or uh, you know the you know the width of the data matters some. The type of computation that given the computers we have isn't such a big deal. The big deal is geez, how do we build these things and how do we get them to communicate and stuff like that? And what's the patterns we should support? Yeah. So uh, what about the applications that run in data centers, like look at where you are uh, like serving the request from users and looking at database and all that kind of stuff? What do we call that? Yeah, so I think in our task that's kind of the, uh, what was it, no coupling thread level parallelism is kind of that area. So there's kind of this, it's a little vague, when you run a bunch of independent tasks that have nothing to do with each other, boy, that's, a, that's pretty easy to program that. Or, but if you think of like Google, which has millions of queries per day, that's kind of, there's a, that's kind of an easy to parallel model you know, that we're trying to capture with the kind of the easy thread level parallelism. Loosely coupled thread level parallelism is what we're, we're, we're trying to talk about. That. No, uh, what we claim is, what is what's, if we were to look inside what are, what are those things doing? And maybe what we'll see that they're doing is a finite state machine, basically. Or maybe what they're doing is some kind of sparse matrix thing where they're trying to do some page ranking thing that's like a sparse, that might be mapped onto a sparse matrix algorithm. That's what we're saying. So one thing is, what are they doing? And then how much parallelism is there? And at Google, you know, there's million way parallelism when, you, when, you've got, when you're serving a lot of people. But we, if I was to, the claim is, if I design a processor and a communication scheme that would support, say, sparse matrix well, Google would think, find that's a good computer for them in the future. So it's, it, it, although I, I have said that, you know, the zero billion dollar, it's probably not true that it's a zero, zero, it's a funny thing to say, but it's probably not true. I know people at, at Sun who are selling Optron-based systems, and they think it's at least a $10 billion market. But that's not what we're focusing on. It's the algorithms of the future independent of the data type. Right. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have worked in. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, w w when we talk to the database people, what they say it doesn't quite fit in our accesses, but you know, interrupt latency, you know, connectivity. But that's kind of. I haven't quite figured out how to put that in there. But yes, I, even supercomputer people say today that increasingly our problems have a lot of data, not just, not, they're not just in the box. So it doesn't make sense anymore to build supercomputers that are I.O. starved. So, but I haven't quite figured out a way to put that in there. OK, okay one more, and then that's it. To what extent do you think that optimizing for these more compelling tax common computers? So our claim is, so uh, these dwarfs are going to be all parallel dwarfs, right? <laughs> so if you visited Microsoft in 2004 and you said, how important is parallel algorithms? And you talk to the programmers. They was, nobody cares about that. Who cares about that? Why are you bringing this subject up? It's a dead, it was a bad idea, it never happened. You visit them this year, they say, oh my God, this is the most important problem in the world. Anybody know anybody we can hire who knows how to write scientific codes? <laughs> so, and what happened between 2004 and 2005? Intel announces the future is parallel and they're not ready for it, right? There have been people at Microsoft saying, this is coming, we start ready, but you know, uh, as I'll say, you know, software people get, pay attention when the hardware shows up, right? So the hardware's showing up and Microsoft isn't ready. So I believe, you know, a solution to parallelism is desperately needed. And I think if you look in, the claim is you'd find these codes at some level data type inside of even Word. That's the claim, okay. So how are we going to build these systems? So what are we going to do? C change is coming. Nobody's ready for a thousand processors per chip. Software people won't work till the stuff shows up. And three months after they show up, they'll tell you everything that's wrong with it. And then we wait four years for the next chip. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what are we going to do? How are we going to get 1,000 processor systems in the hand of researchers so we can get going? It, we desperately need this stuff. How can you do l languages or algorithms or stuff without a 1,000 processor system? Because that's where the hard things are. And can we figure out a way to do this without waiting four years every time we you know, Here's an idea. Let's wait four years. Here's an idea. Let's wait four years. That's, there's certain inadequacy to that approach. OK. So this got started uh, last June at the Computer Architecture Conference, where some of us were talking in the hallway. And the more we talked, the less conferences we went to. And here's the idea, is that basically field programmable gate arrays, which we all use in our courses to teach students how to design hardware, because you can't build chips anymore. And they're very realistic. They're very similar to hardware, not identical, but similar. These things are keep growing by Moore's law. We could fit 25 simple processors in a modern FPGA. What this means, with just 40 of these chips, we could have a 1,000 processor system. Moreover, FPGAs are still on Moore's law. They're, they're, they're improving every one and a half years. And they could double the number of processors, and they'd be a little faster. So here was the hallway conversation. Why don't we? the hardware architecture research community agree on the same set of boards that we all would use. And we, the architecture community, will create an attractive the gate design that you can plug into these 40 FPGAs that will appear to be a 1,000 processor system running 64-bit processors, running your favorite operating system, cache coherent. We could do that. So we, as the people on the, the 10 people on the slide said, it was some of us were at the conference, and then we came back and talked to others. And the 10 of us kind of dropped what we're doing or added to our list of things to do is to make this thing happen. And the name we came up with was RAMP for Research Accelerator for Multiprocessors. So RAMP is our, is our vision here. So what would we want? Suppose we got to, desi you got to design your own research supercomputer. What would you want? You want it to be high scale to get to 1,000 processors. It's got to be cheap because we're academics, right? Funding. We can talk about funding later. OK. Uh, it's got to be cheap to operate, because we don't have very much money. We don't want to, we want to share this work. We want to share the work so we don't have to do it ourselves. We want it, for us, a research supercomputer, debugging is really important to us, because we're always changing the software. We'd like it to be reconfigurable. We could all test all the parameters, memory latency, memory bandwidth. We'd like to do different instruction sets, so we could play with that. Different organizations, was it a two-way multiprocessor? eight-way multiprocessor, and so on. Turn off and on coherency. We want, because we care about research, we want this to be credible. We want people to believe these results. Okay? And we like it to be, performance is at the bottom of this, but it has to be fast enough so it can run an operating system and the results, say, overnight. We don't want results to take a month. We, you know, overnight would be OK. OK, so here's our options here. So I put those things down, and I graded them. So the first is just building, like getting a big SMP from IBM. $40 million. OK, that's academics. OK, next category. <laughs> Clusters are cheaper, a couple of million dollars. If you can afford the couple of million dollars, the other problems are I've spent a lot of time with clusters. Those are pretty expensive to own. If somebody were to donate you a 1,000 processor system, you should say no. <laughs> it may, may seem funny, but you should say no unless they give you a lot of money to run this thing. And it takes up a lot of space. So what we've been doing is we're doing everything on desktops, which is great. It's zero million dollars. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's very flexible. Got a lot of things going for it. You can measure anything. The problem is the performance is terrible. You're not going to build boot 1,000 copies of the operating system and run it on 1,000 things. And the credibility, you know, we, people ar argue about this. I gave it an F. Other people think it's a lot better than that. But people argue about whether they've skipped a lot of important steps in the simulation. So that's the, that's the setting for RAMP. It's, you know, it's more expensive than zero, but not millions of dollars. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's actually very efficient in space and power. And although it's, you know, it's pretty credible in clock cycles, the clock rate you could argue about, but depending whether you use a real processor from a company or you do something fake, it's pretty good. And the clock rate maybe gets a C. It's maybe a factor of 20 slower than the real thing. But factor of 20 is OK. It's not a factor of 2,000, right? So that's kind of the, the bet here, is that we could build this thing. It'd be cheap enough that lots of people could get it, and fast enough that it's OK. And, and it could do things you couldn't do today. We could have reproducibility. Every time you reboot it on clock cycle 1 billion and 4, exactly the same interrupt would happen. And you could trace anything. Anything you want to trace, we can trace for you. Anything you want to measure, you can measure it. OK, and so what kind of, the vision here 
that got us excited in the hallway was, not only would this be interested in us, we think this would be interested in everybody. Everybody. Maybe if me, I hope I'm not insulting any theorists here. If the theorists think it'd be great for them too, I want to include you. But <laughs> people thought maybe not. But you know, what do you want to do? You want to do security enhancements to microprocessors? You want to do 120 bit floating point, transactional memory, data flow languages? What do you want to do? This is you ought to think about using this because of some of the the cheap and their flexibility there. So the hope is we get this water hole to bring everybody together and then we could have these rapid iterations. We could, you know, boy, if, you, if this computer could just do this, we could do this algorithm or we could do this bugging or if I could just trace this stuff, I could, under okay, we can do that. We just have to have the, the exchange across the water hole where the architects will help you make those changes to them. And so I think you know, this is the vision. Uh, and then if this is true, we do the cross-disciplinary stuff it really will make multiprocessing happen sooner because we'll go not every four years, but much more faster than that. So I think it's the standard as the next standard research platform. Certainly back in the 80s, VAX and BSD Unix, everybody got VAX and ran BSD units in computer science. It was just, that was the thing you did. I don't know if there's been another standard since then. Maybe Linux on x86 is maybe. But this could be the new place that everybody would want to compute on. It's got that kind of potential. So how real is this? Actually, the board already exists because this board was created for some other purpose, but it was close enough to be able to use for ramp. This has four FPGAs in the board, and the fifth one is uh, as a uh, controller. Uh, that John Warstick and Bob Broderson did this for digital signal processing, but it's perfect for this thing. Just you can put a bunch of them in a box, so that's how we can get the thousand processor system. So what's the status? We've got a web page. IBM and Sun have promised to donate their instruction set architectures, reconfigurable, so it'll be industrial strength. We have a design language, technical report. We sent an NSF infrastructure proposal in. Uh, we've done a short course about RAMP and the RAMP design languages, uh, met with people, and we're going to have retreats, and uh, we've been talking on the phone. Our milestones as of, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we're going to have red, blue, and white, red being Stanford colors, and that's going to get us started for the first half of this year using, there's some PowerPC so-called hard cores on it. So we'll get, port the transactional memory stuff from Stanford onto that. Blue is Berkeley, one of Berkeley's colors, and we're going to try and build a high scale thing using very simple processors, and we hope to do that by the second half of this year. White, everybody's going to work on, and that's the full vision. It's going to have all the features, multiple instruction sets. I don't know quite how many will fit in there, uh, with uh, cache coherence, shitters, everything, it's got everything in it, and we're all going to be working on that one. And then what the idea is, and then sometime, you know, if all this works, after that, we'll build this next generation board using much newer uh, two generations of later FPGAs, and that'll be the thing that we'll make available at some small company to sell so that, you know, that's, the Berkeley wouldn't be in the manufacturing business if people wanted to get them to just buy it from this company at, at low margins. Okay, here's the, got a lot of people on board, you know, people, you can imagine at Intel and Microsoft right now, this is a great idea. <laughs> what the hell are we going to do about, okay, they'd like this idea and some academics do too. So let me do conclusions and more questions. So remember the hurting productivity stuff, let's deliver productivity, let's make some, build things that are understandable, no surprises and accurate, reliable. We've got this provocative idea about maybe we can pick the things that we should focus on rather than looking backwards. And the ones that we pick, at least the ones we pick, looked pretty data parallel, uh, which, uh, uh, although lots of operand sizes, which was surprising. Uh, ramp, my last slide. So kind of at a high level, like ACM president thing, this is an example of spending research dollars more efficiently. We could have, we would have, if we hadn't talked, all built our own boards individually and all done the development. That's been a lot more expensive. By agreeing to share and build, it's kind of a more exciting project and cheaper, too. This is something that we could use if parallelism is the future, and it is. Boy, we need this as soon as possible. Building on the Berkeley hardware gets us started there rather than doing it ourselves. Architects get to help everybody in, uh, in the field like our software colleagues have in the open source movement. We'll get the generations faster, and really there's nothing you can't measure here. And we're hoping to create this watering hole, which will do this innovation multiprocessing across fields and hasten this change, sea change from sequential to parallel. All right. I'd like to thank myself for giving talk. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
OK. As promised, there's time for questions. So RAM seems to be a, a nice prototype to play with architectural parameters, right? Architectural parameters, right. Right. But I, I can see the value for that of that for an architect. But what are the parameters that you see are important in the future to play with? Uh, well, the question is about RAM. Is, well, I think if I was doing software development, I would drop whatever I'm using. And you believe in parallelism as the future. Ramp is the platform for you. First of all, I don't know where you're going to access to a thousand processor system if you want to test your thing at that level. Secondly, it's got the ability to see everything that's going on inside and actually enough extra resources to trace whatever you want. So it's got a transparency that you can't get in any computer today. And we're, what our goal is in the logic design is we're going to make something reproducible that every single time it'll operate the same way. And you can't get that in any environment. So I think it's extraordinarily attractive for software developers in that area. In terms of, you know, we're going to do, there's all kinds of things that those of us in the ramp that we're going to do with it. There's people interested in data flow designs. There's people interested in security. I'm interested in using it to emulate uh, the internet. You know, there's all kinds of applications to use it, if, if that's what your question is. Yes, I can see how, you, how it helps you understand architectures. But I was wondering if you actually have a sort of a vision of where you see architectures going. Yeah, I, I think, go back to the first part of the talk. We need to understandable parallel architectures that have a compiler model, language model, or maybe one of these auto-tuner things so that every day, you know, somebody with a PhD in physics can actually program it, right, rather than not be able to program it. You know, I just was sitting at breakfast yesterday and the guy next to me was a physicist talking about how this code didn't run right until some computer science got a hold of it, right? It's kind of weird that you need a PhD in computer science to get your program to run on these, these machines. So it'd be, we, that would be our goal is to build things like that. I personally think vectors are very promising in that area. And I, I'm interested in looking at that personally. But I, I know, I'm not sure that's the right answer, but I, those characteristics that at compile time or very early in the process, you have a simple to understand model and that scientists can use it would be, you know, the positive characteristics I'd be shooting for. So I do some work with programming languages and, and trying to make things a little bit easier for wider groups of people. And I think that is a very, very important thing and one of the major challenges, certainly in my area. Um, but I would ask you, sort of tying that in with the dwarfs you mentioned, um, once you have empowered physicists and engineers to program uh, concurrent and parallel software more easily, why and why would the software they come out with look the same as this Fortran plus MPI stuff they've been doing for the last oh, de yeah. decade? Why, why, would it, why would it continue to look so, like So uh, I don't think the dwarfs are Fortran plus MPI. Well, okay. Th those are algorithms, right? right. I don't think I don't think it will. It shouldn't. Right. If it's Fortran plus MPI. Uh, that you know we failed, right? Why are they why are they doing Fortran plus MPI? Clusters are extraordinarily attractive, cost-effective things for them. They don't have to share, get one hour a month on a supercomputer. They can have their own. So that is why they're doing it. How do they pro the only thing the only possible way you can program that thing is MPI in some programming language? That's not because they like it, right? That that's kind of what they can afford and works for them. So I think we could do some. We better be able to do something. You know, for us to get funding in this century, we better be able to do a lot better than that. But it's, it, I, I guess I shouldn't have said four tramples MBI because that's so loaded. But I guess what I meant was more the, the more loosely coupled. Um, so here's an example. So kind of we computer scientists always make fun of those guys with Fortran my whole life. This is ever since my first programming class was in Fortran. The second one, we made pe fun of people who wrote in Fortran. Right? <laughs> they use MATLAB yeah. every day. They use MATLAB every day. If we could make MATLAB run on a supercomputer, easy to they would drop Fortran in a second. All right. So it's 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 they're not they're not uh, Neanderthals unwilling to learn new things. A bunch of them do learn C plus plus and write stuff. God help them. In in in, in, <laughs> in because we told them that was the best thing to do. So they're they these problems they want to solve and they'd like to be able to solve them personally, you know, to do that. So I think I don't think it's. Uh, um, and interacting with them, I believe they would be happy to do that if it helped them solve their problem. But it wasn't that, I mean, that was sort of, that, that was sort of a little bit tangential to my question. I, I guess my question is, you were saying that the dwarves are really the important classes of algorithms that you're going to be addressing, and the dwarves are all these sort of very loosely coupled things, whereas, you know, a lot of focus has been made on these very, these very tightly coupled things like shared memory, where, where, where the dwarves don't live. If, 
sounded like that was part of what you were saying. Yeah. Well, and, and it seems to me like, like as you make the sort of shared memory thing a little bit more accessible, that would be where people would try to go. Uh, so the, the comment, if you didn't hear, was basically if shared memory become more common, we'd end up with more shared memory algorithms. Uh, you know, I've been hearing this for a while. I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure that's true. It could be uh, that there could be that a shared memory is a more difficult to program model because you don't know when you're communicating. But, and, and the, you know, at least from the, for the scientific computing side, they're worried about numerical ability. And that's not something you just randomly throw an algorithm and you know what the answer is. But I think the fact that the scientists have, have found these small, if there are a small number of dwarfs that we should be focusing on, let's at least build computers that run them well. It's not so clear that shared memory multiprocessors are really great for some of these algorithms, right? Let's, but let's make sure what we do in languages and all that stuff, it runs those well. You know, that'll probably be a pretty good foundation to go from there. And then if we can use the ramp stuff to explore the space, we maybe we'll end up with very innovative languages beyond that. Dr. Patterson will be here for a little while to answer any questions any of you may have or to autograph your dwarves. Uh, so <laughs> thank him again.